Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sadie Groom. I'm the Managing Director of Bubble Agency and I'm also the founder of RISE. And it's a pleasure this afternoon. Uh, so this afternoon for me in the UK, and good morning <laughs> to my guest, uh, Margaret Craig, who's the CEO of Sydney Ends. Um, I really wanted to have a rising conversation with, with Margaret, especially in what is sort of IBC week. Um, as a major player in the sector. So, I, you know, it's really important for me to get somebody um, who's so well known as Margaret. So thank you for your time, Margaret. I know you're busy. Um, and obviously, you know, it's been a weird, weird old time the past couple of months, <laughs> yeah. hasn't it? So, Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and, I, you know, I feel like, it, you know, hopefully, you know, through this chat and through everything the Rise does is that, you know, we can learn a bit more about you and a bit more about Sydney. And we were just talking a bit about Zoom fatigue, so um, we're not going to go on for hours and hours. <laughs> um, but I've got some great questions for Margaret. So, um, so I, I, I'm going to start off with Margaret. Um, if you could just tell us a bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. Sure, I come from a technology background. So I got an engineering degree in university. And then when I graduated, luckily and somewhat randomly, my first job was at a company that made products for media companies. And I kind of fell in love with that right away and have stayed in the sector the whole time. So again, was very lucky to land there. I worked as a design engineer for several years and then had the opportunity to get experience managing people and projects and eventually businesses. So that's really what I do is manage businesses in media technology and have worked at various companies, big companies, little companies and divisions just doing that. Okay, and how long have you been at Signia now? Ooh, about eight years. Uh, eight long time. years, wow. Yeah. Um, and, and for anybody out there who doesn't know what Signium is and does, do you want to just explain what Signium do? I also know it, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, we, our history is in technology that adapts networks for moving very large data sets, so media content over IP networks. So that's right. where we came from, and now we've built a pretty extensive technology stack above that to um, move content in and out of various kinds of storage and do other kinds of things with that content. Okay. Um, and so you're working with major broadcasters and sports companies and... Yeah, one thing about our technology is that we actually serve the entire media supply chain. So we address use cases at the very front end in production and post-production all the way through to distribution. And we serve okay. broadcast sports, the film studios. So we try to keep the products so that they can be used across the whole ecosystem. Yeah. And, um, and actually, this wasn't a question that I sent you in my list, but I just thought <laughs> when you're talking about having a, having a degree in engineering and, and having yeah. that tech technology experience, how, how, how does that come to play with being a CEO? Do, you know, it's actually it, 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 yeah, it's an interesting thing because as I look back on my various jobs, it has mattered a different amount in the different jobs right. because sometimes you're managing something that is very technically complex and so really need a deep understanding. Other times, it's kind of good in terms of establishing credibility when you walk into a room full of engineers, yeah, which is sort of, a, <laughs> sort of a lightweight thing, but it does help, right? So it yeah, helps absolutely. in terms of customer engagement. It also helps in managing engineers because they know they can't bamboozle you. <laughs> so I would say it's a very helpful thing in your background, but in yeah. my day-to-day -day work, I'm not doing technical things, yeah. but also a technical education does give you a lot of problem solving skills. Mm. And a lot of being a CEO is problem solving. So just having that kind of background is I think generally useful. And wh where did you learn that business element? Was that learned on the job through your various roles or did you go back yeah, to college? 
pretty much on the job. i certainly had classes and coursework along the way um but i was very fortunate to have some really good mentors who yeah set me up in situations where i could manage a very small business initially to understand the dynamics of that and their various functions and they put me in situations where i couldn't do too much damage and had a lot of support around me. so i was very very lucky in that regard yeah i think mentoring is just so important it's um, so critical yeah yeah and, and i think it's um important for the mentors as well i think you know i i have i've been mentoring through the rise program for a couple of years now and it, it's you know and i learn a lot as well as the mentor absolutely um, so, yeah so yeah i think that's really important um so i wanted to ask you about any particular accomplishments that shaped your career if there's anything that really stands out and since I've always been, for a very long time, have been managing people, really I don't have, my accomplishments are always through others. But I will yeah. note a specific experience that I think has been, has really helped shape my career. And that is that um, about 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to go work on the other side of the table. So I became a customer of technology rather than a provider of technology. And that was a super interesting and useful experience for me because you think you understand the customer's businesses and you kind of do at an intellectual level, but you don't yeah. get it at a visceral and emotional level until you're the one sitting in that chair. <laughs> so it was very interesting and helpful for me to have I think four or five years there where I was running a large scale on air television facility. And wow. that gave me a, a different level of understanding. Now my, I, I really am a product person and I like products. So I came back over to the other side. So but I think yeah. I can do the product and technology side now with a different level of empathy for those customers because I've been in their shoes. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That sense. Great thing. So what do you enjoy most about working in media and entertainment? Oh, I, I love the industry. So, yeah. you know, I think the, um, the intersection between technology and creativity is super interesting to me. And it's, I like the pace of change, but always with that underpinning of what can you do technically, but you're not doing technology for technology's sake, you're doing it to yeah. empower storytelling. And I, I just love that. I also like the people in this industry. And I like being in an industry that, it's, as, as you know, Sadie, it's the kind of thing where people come into it and either they never leave because they develop a passion for it, or they, Hands up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or they just get out right away. So I yeah. like being in an industry with that continuity, and I like seeing in building long-term relationships with both customers and colleagues in the industry. So for me, that's a real positive. I mean, yeah. sometimes, as you know, sometimes we feel like we need to get out more and it, it gets kind of, <laughs> kind of insular, but um, I think you'd agree with me that that's a, that's a great thing about our industry. It is, and I think it's just, you know, the, the conversation we were having around the trade shows, and I think that's just where everybody is missing having that connection so much yeah yeah um, certainly so. i think the the trade show thing is probably going to evolve but i'm certainly a believer in face-to-face -face meetings yeah yeah me too we, we actually had some face-to-face -face meetings in our office yesterday and it was great everybody loved it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was yeah i don't i just don't think that that's going to go away the people who write those newspaper yeah. articles about the end of in-person business i think don't live the life i lead being no, on zoom all no. day it's just it's, yeah. it's not going to be <laughs> not going to happen no i agree with that so um Talking of uh, rapidly changing times, I mean, obviously we have the global pandemic, but also the media and entertainment industry is rapidly changing as well as the moment um, and has been for a while. And I think it's always quite fast paced in terms of development. 
Um, you know, obviously you're leading a company and a big player in, in, in this sort of change. You know, what does that feel like to you? Well, it certainly is interesting times. Like you say, it's the layers that are kind of interesting that we had this big picture change and then an abrupt event on top of it. I will say yeah. that leading change gets easier as you get more experience. And one of the things I've noted this time is, yes, the pandemic is a weird crisis to manage through and each one is different, <laughs> but having managed through September 11th and the Great Recession and other times of great crisis or change, there's certain things that you learn along the way and each one is unique, but there are elements of managing change that you just yeah. frankly get better at and kind of know what to do. Mm, absolutely. And, and you know, what does that mean? Because obviously Signe, it's a global business. How does that, you know, how, how has that been during this time? Well, it, it makes it harder to um, maintain the connections between the people. Now, fortunately, we're, you know, a software company, you can, you can run software companies remotely, but we're used to being able to um, see each other. You know, we have our employees are spread around the world. Our development is all in Canada, and the headquarters of the company is in Boston. So even that for us has been a challenge because we were, I was used to going to Ottawa all the time, having off-site meetings. So yeah, the more spread out you are, the more challenging it is. And just like you, we've found in the last few, you know, probably the last month, we've started to have some in-person meetings here in Boston. Yeah. But we can't go beyond that for the global team. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And just in terms of, you know, without the pandemic and media and entertainment industry changing, you know, is there anything you're seeing as it's gonna be the next big thing? <laughs> that's always, that's always the question. Yeah, I think that it isn't going to be one thing. There's just so many vectors of change. And I think that's one of the things we're going to see is that in, you know, 20 years ago, you tended to have one wave of change. So it would be, okay, we need to change from standard definition to high definition. And so everybody would kind of ride that wave through. And now there's just so many different things going on. So yeah. a lot of what we have to do is look at it's just a bunch of puzzle pieces and a bunch of different vectors rather than one big wave. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and like, how do you think like media and entertainment has adapted to what's happened with the pandemic? Do you think, it, you know, do you think we've reacted well to it? Do you think it's, you know, there's been obviously some good and bad things that have come out of it. Yeah, as I look across our thousands of customers, I would say some have adapted better than others, right? So there's, there's a range of things. But one of the things that I see kind of settling in is people looking out on the horizon and saying, okay, at the end of this, there still will be a media and entertainment industry. Yeah. So people want to watch professionally produced media content. And so one of the, after the initial panic and disorientation, one of the things I think is good right now is people are, everybody across the board is looking out there saying, there is something at the other side. It isn't like um, all of the consumers in the world are saying, no, nope, we don't want any more video. Right. Yeah. So it's a matter of getting through this and figuring out what that looks like, which will be very different. But at a macro level, there is an industry. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody still has that square box. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people still have that square box in, in yeah. their living area. And obviously, we now have various other devices where we're watching content. So. Um, uh, and I think, you know, as live sports come back in and things like that, then I think, you know, you can just see the levels of engagement with that now, you yeah. know, and how everybody missed that so much. Yeah, and we may watch it on different devices. It may get distributed to those devices in different ways, but it's still content. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, 
So just going back, you know, a little bit sort of to sort of yourself and your career, I was going to ask you what you wanted to be when you grew up. <laughs> I, was, I was not a focused child who had a vision of what I wanted to do. <laughs> I know some people are like that and as small children, but I, I was not like that. I just kind of flitted from flower to flower and found things, as I found things I was interested in, I was very interested. But um, I, in fact, when I first went off to university, I was studying marine biology. So I had a, a winding road. <laughs> Uh, excellent. What made you change? Um, well, I thought marine biology was kind of boring to me and I'm afraid of water. So it turned oh. out to not be a great choice. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it, it's an example of, you know, meanwhile, I was taking math classes and calculus and physics um, in university and that was very interesting to me. So I moved over to engineering. Yeah. So really yeah. just, I, Again, not a, not a great sense of direction, but certainly um, diving in when I did find things that were compelling to me. Yeah. Um, and what do you feel like is the biggest impact you've had at Signet? I think it really has been about managing change because yeah. we've gone through not only the changes broadly in the industry, but as a company, we've gone through a big change of moving to a SaaS implementation of our technology, which has very broad-based implications across the whole business. So you need to change a lot of the functions and build new functions. And of course, anytime you're making a big business model and technology change, there's some people who don't come through to the other side and you have to bring some new people in. So really it's been managing change there has been my biggest yeah. impact. And, and how have you learned to do that? I mean, do you, do you, are you still keeping educating yourself? Do you read lots of business books? I do. I still read things. Um, one of the things that I think I didn't learn early enough in my career is just the importance of having a broad network that you can compare notes with and yeah. being willing and able to reach out. So mm -hmm. early on, I men mentioned that I had some great mentors and so I had like one person there I could go to but what I find now is super helpful to me is just to have the great broad-based global network I have and if I'm facing a particular challenge or want to bounce ideas around I very much reach out and have this network of people uh, that I can draw on. And is that fellow CEOs or is it different levels of people? It's all different levels because yeah. I think there are things where, you know, there's certain things where another CEO will have a certain kind of insight. But as I look at my network, there are some people who have super high emotional intelligence and can help you think through a people related issue or a culture, culture related issue. And those people yeah. might not be CEOs. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's very true. I think it's just worth having that. So, you know, the bigger that network, the more useful it is, isn't it? Just, yeah. And, you know, you have to reach particular... out, though. Right? That yes, was one of the things do. for me that you do. And, and that was one of the things for me to, um, that I had to work on and learn to do is to, to, to maintain the relationship and absolutely to reach out. Yeah, and I actually I like I like the the term that you're using, reaching out rather than asking for help, because I think yeah. sometimes we, sometimes we, we're scared to ask for help almost. Um, so and I think it, you know so, so sometimes you know I think you have to get into doing that and get used to doing it. Yeah, and I, that's a good point, Sadie. That I think that sometimes, especially earlier in your, in your career it feels like weakness to ask for help. Yeah, yeah. Right, and you, and you want yeah. to sort of show, I know how to do this. And I think <laughs> that's a really important thing to get through and realize, no, I actually don't. <laughs> but I do know a lot of people who probably have some interesting ideas. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, what advice would you give to anybody who, um, you know, in any sort of stage of their career, really, but I think, you know, 
one of the reasons that I called Rise Rise was because I, I, I could see, in particular, there weren't many females um, at, the t at the top of the industry. But, you know, and this isn't a, a particularly female related question, but, you know, how can people get up to being CEO? What, you know, you've already talked about some things that you thought you maybe should have done earlier on in your career and things that you've learned. So, you know, what pieces of advice would you give? I, really, I guess I would really go back to the thing of focusing on um, things that are very interesting to you. So yeah. I think it can be hard and frustrating for people if they just decide they want to be a CEO. For me, yeah. and because you may not be able to get there, or it may be hard to define the next step. For me, yeah. it was about... I was genuinely interested in bigger picture things. So I was interested as I managed projects and then business was very interesting to me. And yeah. so for me, it was a matter of, as I found things that I was interested in, really digging in and learning and getting that experience. Now, I, I think for other people, maybe it is more of an intentional career mapping but I would just encourage people to think about what you're really interested in and make sure that you dedicate your, your full energies and focus yeah. on that thing. Yeah, one, one of my friends um, who is very got a very successful career in uh, WPP, and she always says, be interested and be interested. Yeah. And I, yeah. You know, and, and I think that really comes back to, you know, remembering that we've got two ears and one mouth sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> for a reason. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that, that, I think that is a really good point because it, it applies across the whole spectrum. It applies in if you're dealing with customer executives to be genuinely interested in what's going on in their business. But it, likewise, it applies to the most junior employees in your company that be interested in their careers and yeah. the experience they're having at your company too. And make yeah. sure that listening is, is super important at both ends of that spectrum. Yeah. And, you know, is there any particular advice you've got for people just coming into the industry? I would say, actually, they don't don't hesitate to ask for help and insight. Yeah, and to build relationships with people. You know, I love it when people reach out to me and say, "Hey, can I have 15 minutes of your time to chat about X, Y, or Z?" So don't hesitate to do that. And I think that's one of the things that um, women can sometimes be more hesitant to do. Mm -hmm. And one Very of the true. things we need to keep encouraging that as a um, it's just reach out there and build those connections. Yeah. Um, and I've got a question around Signion, uh, and it's just something that's always quite interested me, which is around, I know you were re recently awarded a patent. Um, so can you tell, how was that process? Was it easy? Was it difficult? Was it? Yeah, that, that's so an interesting question. <laughs> yeah, so it's something that, um, it's a part of the technology industry that is pretty interesting. So Signian has, I think, 12 patents now. And this particular one was just issued, obviously I wasn't the inventor, three of my colleagues, so it was issued to Shane and Andrew and Ian, my colleagues, um, with a very, about a very esoteric thing. So if you read the patent, you'd probably think, ooh, this is um, it's pretty complicated. But the, the reason it's meaningful to us as a technology company is that it communicates to our customers and the industry at large that we're innovating. Yeah. Because there are pretty high barriers. So you can apply for a patent on anything, but mm -hmm. the patent office scrubs through it very carefully and you have a whole list of claims and they decide whether you have really invented something that warrants a patent and there's a long back and forth process. So it really validates when you're um, issued a patent that you have invented something and you have, are innovative. And that's one of the, the messages that I want to send to the industry about Signian 
is that we are real innovators. Yeah, excellent. And, and do you, you know, have you found that's changed during the pandemic? Is it is it driven that more? Is it have you pulled back on it? Is it just the same? It's it, it's pretty much the same. There's kind of a there's a long lead time and long planning horizons for our development. Mm -hmm. So um, at, a, at a macro product level, there hasn't really been a shift in our innovation, but certainly as people responded to the pandemic, um, yeah. there was a lot of creativity in terms of, whoa, what do I do with this workflow? How do I bring it into the home? Yeah. And certainly given the relationship we have with our customers, we were very involved in a lot of those creative processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then certainly some um, operational creativity required. So in the early months of the pandemic, our calls to our customer support went up by forty percent. Wow. So yeah, and so it was a big shift in just more people using our technology for more new workflows. Yeah. So being able to react and respond to that requires a certain level of creativity. <laughs> Absolutely, good way to put it. <laughs> um, and as we're in what would have been IBC week, um, I think, yeah. you know, for me, for me, I, and I know Margaret, you've done many as well. This would have been my twenty fifth, so I've never had this weekend off ever. Um, <laughs> it feels like, um, you know, have you got any particular thoughts about the future of trade shows? Yeah, it, it will be very interesting to see. I think it may shift some um, in terms of maybe it'll be smaller, more fragmented shows. But back to what we were talking about earlier is I just don't see face-to-face -face meetings going away. Yeah. And trade shows are an opportunity to, in a short period of time, have a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think in some form there will be industry gatherings and it'll be interesting to see how that form shifts around a little bit. There probably will be some changes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've got a couple of questions uh, for you. Um, one is somebody has uh, asked how are Signant embracing the trend of 5G? So, um, for, for Signian, 5G is um, is probably going to be, in general, a positive force, but it doesn't directly impact our technology. So, I think okay. as, uh, so we can work over 5G technology just like we can work over other networking technologies. So, we don't particularly have to do development work, but we will certainly make sure that we support mm -hmm. that trend in the industry. Yeah. Okay. Um, and another question is, you mentioned the importance of your network. Is this your most valuable asset? I would say yes, it is. Yeah. It's certainly, um, it, it's certainly the one that, that, that I treasure the most and put energy into making sure I maintain. Yeah. How do you grow that network, especially at the moment? Is that something you feel that you've been able to do? Not particularly in the, in the pandemic, because, because I will say that, you know, back to that face to face is, I don't think you, it's pretty hard to build a network with two dimensional interactions. It's sort of a 3D activity. Yeah. yeah. It's the spontaneity, isn't it? It's, it's that, you know, me meeting you and, and then someone else coming over that knows me and me, you know, introducing each exactly. other or, or that thing. Um, yeah, yeah and we just can't seem to replace that. Yeah, um, I think there'd be a very rich person out there if they'd worked out how to replace that. <laughs> I know. I know. You can certainly maintain that work in, in this environment, but I think it's pretty hard to grow. Yeah, I think it is. So, um, I have, well, I've got one more question um, for you. And um, I was asking people this when I was doing some NAB uh, webinars back in May. Um, what's been the best thing you've watched on TV over the past few months? 
Now, this is going to be, that's kind of, this is going to be kind of embarrassing, Sadie, but I'm actually not a big TV watcher. Yeah. Oh my. <laughs> so, I'm going to have to say, I'm not a huge, I, I love visual media through the lens I work in it, but I'm really yeah. more of a book person. Ah, okay. Any any good book recommendations? <laughs> um, I am currently reading The Night Watchman by Louise Erdick. But that's mm -hmm. kind of a it's very, she's a Native American writer. Um, so that's maybe a, a specific lens that doesn't really apply globally. But um, yeah. that, that's what's on my nightstand right now. Yeah, excellent. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for your time today, Margaret. It's been a real pleasure speaking to you. Um, and obviously, you know, being, you know, from a RISE perspective, um, it's great having female CEOs. I did a, before I started RISE, I did a count up of all the female CEOs in the industry and we, we got it to less than, it was definitely less than 1% of the industry. So, we, we, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think we need to keep working on that one. <laughs> we need to keep working on that. So, so, um, and for anybody out there listening, um, we have got some news that we're going to be announcing in the next couple of weeks about our efforts in North America, um, which are expanding, which is great. And don't forget to nominate people for the Rise Awards. Um, which will be closing at the end of September. And you can do all that on the RISE website, which is risewib.com. So thanks again, Margaret. Um, have a great weekend, everybody. Um, and we'll see you soon.